Good morning or good afternoon. Thank you, Anne, for that wonderful introduction, I would say. Um, did I pass the Turing test? <laughs> so, uh, yes, um, you guys know what the Turing test is, right? Everybody in here, every single person. Well, uh, the Turing test, of course, is what's kind of started us down this road of figuring out and building smart machines. Being that, you know, uh, <clears throat> Alan Turing basically made the standard for us to decide whether a machine is intelligent or not. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, that standard is basically having a conversation with a machine and not being able to, to discern whether or not uh, you were talking to a machine or to another human. So I'm glad and I hope I passed the test. So today's topic is what does the machine know? AI science and fiction. Um, and I'm gonna start it off with a little look at the history um, of AI. So uh, in class we went, we pulled up, and I showed this is from Harvard, um, and from there they linked out two infographics. And when I looked at this particular timeline, um, I chose it because it was very much and very pertinent to what we were doing um, in terms of this topic being science or fiction. And as you look on here, timeline of artificial intelligence, and what do we see? We see um, Alan Turing there, and then we get into some other stuff here, which is um, <clears throat> talking about uh, commander data, right? And we're getting into um, <clears throat> AI, artificial intelligence from Steven Spielberg. <laughs> Lots of fiction in this timeline for uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and so uh, I wanted to talk about the, and have a discussion, because I'm going to ask you guys to participate. You're going to have to have, this one will be talking, you're going to be back and forth. But, <clears throat> When I first saw that movie, AI, um, it prompted me, it, it kind of ticked me off, quite frankly. It's like, it didn't really address what AI really is. They kind of addressed the story of Pinocchio through the eyes of an intelligent robot. Um, but it didn't really get into the, the actual definition or true representation. And I don't know about you guys, but um, when I, I like my fiction to be real. Uh, right? <clears throat> and I know that a lot of us do, and that's why we have the technology that we do today. Right? Now we have scanners, and tomorrow we probably have a couple of tricorders, uh, etc. Right? And we're going down that route. I'll be going down that route rather quickly. Um, and, and so, in terms of that movement forward in the technology, is a lot of misinformation, misconceptions um, that we have received because science fiction has kind of driven. Our field, the field, all fields of technology, right? Um, and so that's what's kind of driving this. Um, and we don't really know what this technology uh, is, right? We're still kind of nebulous about it. And our fiction stories that we tell um, <clears throat> are concentrating a lot on the negative aspects of technology. Um, does anybody know of any fiction stories, movies, whatever, that cover AI that does not 
go back in time and kill everybody? <laughs> Why do we have to tell that story? It seems that that's the only story that people want to sell. Short circuit. Short circuit? Okay. Oh, that's an only. Oh my gosh. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're far, you know, in between. It's to find these types of stories um, that actually describe the technology accurately um, is very hard to find. And I think that kind of goes towards that misconceptions that we have about that. Now, I, I don't know about you guys, but when we started our computer gaming program uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, we had a whole influx of students who are interested because, again, the media, true media, was hyping all these games and all the media and you know, developing all of these uh, and making it look so cool and wonderful to come in there. And they come in and then they say, here's C++, here's mathematics. And then all of a sudden that enrollment goes, you know, from 100 to one and a half. <laughs> so um, the same thing, you know, is happening with AI. And part of being able to develop a curriculum that would not turn students away involve understanding the technology. Um, and uh, we found that even with our faculty, our computer science faculty, my colleagues, and we all share these similar types of um, approaches where we thought and think that you're going to need to do a whole lot of mathematics. Um, and that was the example that uh, Anne was talking about, um, as well as with the programming, right? Um, and we had a, a, a lively discussion yesterday uh, that was awesome. I loved it. Um, and about including what level of programming is necessary and, uh, in terms of for a program as well as the entry into the program, you need prerequisites, etc. So, uh, understanding the technology and understanding that whole stack um, is important in the leveling process of. Uh, any uh, program that we're going to do. And uh, when we were going through that process, uh, that leveling piece was ingrained in us by Anne, by <laughs> repeatedly, like, it's an applied degree. It's an applied degree. Um, and so uh, it's important to understand where you stand uh, in the process. So today we are actually going to talk a little bit more about chat uh, GPT and large language models. There are many of them out there, but I'm going to focus on uh, chat GPT mainly because of its popularity. Um, uh, and so I did the same thing. I went into the chat GPT and I said, uh, generate for me a timeline um, of uh, important AI events and to create that timeline that is more academic than, or real than fiction, right? Um, in terms of generating this list, even knowing this, it didn't give, it, it didn't give me everything. Uh, I had to go back in and say, uh, include like AlexNet and um, uh, Neocognition and Backdrop, all of these different, uh, very, very important milestones in the development of this technology. So, in this brief history here, you'll see we start out and with uh, the 
Alan uh, Alan Turing and the Turing machine and the Turing test. Um, it threw in the, the Turing uh, machine as the starting point for you know the this process, but you know we didn't need to uh, kind of debate it. You should put it there. I left it there. Um, and then we get into the fifties with the birth of AI, with the uh, term uh, AI being coined uh, at the Dartmouth meeting that they had. <clears throat> then we had from there we, uh, the perceptron being created. I don't know what the perceptron is. I know what's a perceptron. So everyone know what a neuron is, though, right? Right. So a uh, perceptron is the base unit of an artificial uh, neural network, and it is the single cell, so to speak, uh, uh, for encoding information. Um, and so that's when we had our first perceptron. Uh, is defined. It was just a base model. Uh, then we had machine learning being coined. We had a chatbot uh, being developed in the sixties with Eliza. Um, we had the first robot to navigate uh, and avoid obstacles. I remember when being at Nova, um, uh, we were teaching artificial intelligence, but um, we're looking at bio, bio algorithms. I wasn't teaching that back then. Uh, I was an administrator running it. We had computer science faculty doing that, and fuzzy math and all of that. And so that experience gave me uh, the exposure at, a, at an early uh, point regarding this field. And that's where I can uh, took up uh, my interest, especially with fuzzy math. I just love the term fuzzy map. So, um, so I had to go and figure out what it was. And then we got into uh, our expert systems, neocognition. So neocognition was the precursor to convolutional neural networks. That was the uh, next step up from the perceptron that made some uh, progress in the, in the field. Uh, and with the advent of Backprop, um, then it was uh, applied uh, to the Net5, um, which, by the way, was the first um, handwritten, ca character written um, AI to, that was actually adopted by the US Postal Service for reading handwritten uh, addresses and zip codes. Uh, from there, we go into uh, uh, our current neural network, so you can start seeing with these um, uh, advances, we started making more and more uh, uh, progress. Um, <clears throat> we got into AlexNet in 2012, and AlexNet came around from uh, a resource called ImageNet. Have anyone used ImageNet or heard of ImageNet? Yeah. So ImageNet is a large database of uh, images uh, that's been labeled um, uh, uh, for research purposes, and uh, they started having these competitions in 2010. Um, I think it was Professor Fee. I think it was Professor Fee who was at Princeton and then is now at Stanford. Um, and she developed that, that huge repository of images that's been classified. Uh, meaning, by the way, classification means that you take a, an image and you tell it what objects are in that image so that you can train a model to recognize these images. Um, Next, from there, uh, we got into, uh, from the visual, because these were all about computer vision, then we got into the natural language processing technology, started using deep learning and, and neural nets being applied to that, which led to the word embeddings and eventually to our 
large language models, which is from BERT and now into GPT. Uh, I don't want to skip over general ad uh, generative adversarial networks um, because those are the types of models that generate okay um, different uh, or intent to copy so to speak particular types of works right um, so uh, what a general uh, a gang is is you train a model to um, try and produce a fake or duplicate of some image or language, etc. Um, it was developed for images, so they were working with images. So if you would generate an image, uh, and you would then have a model that's trained to detect if that image was generated, if it was fake. Um, and you would use that in that recurrent process for training. Um, and so uh, what we're seeing today with uh, these large language models is that they are generative models, right? So five points for who could tell me what GPT stands for and the AI students can, you can't guess. <laughs> Thank you, yes. So it's generative pre-trained transform. So it's it's in the name, right? So they're generating um, those um, uh, for the language models. They're generating each and every word that you get as a response. It's generating one word, utilizing that information that it predicted, and from that, try and predict the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So they're predicting the output in a serialized manner. <clears throat> so uh, generative uh, adversarial, adversarial networks are very important from uh, that perspective. This that guides us to where we're at. Um, Google's AlphaGo uh, was also a, a major step forward as well. Um, it was, they were able to train uh, a model to play Go, the game of Go, uh, better than any human can do. So all the, 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 the known expert was overthrown by a piece of software. Hence why we're all afraid of it, right? <clears throat> well, um, like I tell uh, in the class, I'm not afraid of the technology, I'm afraid what we humans do with the technology. So the point of this talk is to try and elucidate, elucidate on what these capabilities really are, right? So I said, we're going to have a conversation today, and if I don't hear from you, but you, I'm just like pulling tea here from you. That's a good answer, you know? So <clears throat> I'm gonna to talk to Chat GPT and trade instead. Is that okay? It's okay, all right. So let's just talk to them and see what it tells us. So these are gonna be my questions that I'm gonna ask. And hopefully uh, when we see the answers, um, you guys, uh, I'm gonna ask for your input on that as well. So <clears throat> we, we have to have not only one artificial intelligence in there. So, and I'm going to thank you. Uh, so, I'm going to ask it. I'm making a presentation on fact and fiction, uh, fiction about AI model capabilities. Uh, create a 20 question true or false quiz with 10 questions each for the most popular AI facts. And fiction. Imagine what the results should be. Put it in your head right now. Think about that. From what 
your general perception is about this technology. Right? So <clears throat> let's see what it tells us. Let's see if it passes the Turing test. I guess so. <laughs> so this is the same thing that was happening in class, right? We had that, that delay in there. And um, as I was talking to Juan about mentioning that, we were trying I was trying to figure out you know, was it something in uh, the network here or was it um, uh, open AI uh, restricting it? So I <laughs> I'm paying for four. <laughs> it's, but it's not. It's not about four. It's not responding. Say hello. No, I can't even type in it. It's not getting into the text. It's very And that's what I'm saying. And I, I wasn't sure this was going to happen. We'll see. All right. Let's try something else. And this is the reason why I'm thinking use a different plugin if you have a plugin. Oh, I don't. Use it. I, I don't. Almost there. There, there. Yeah. Oh, let's see if it works. There you go. Now, I was going to take this and make this into a little quiz, interactive quiz and everything, but I said, I, I think it's better if we all see what it gives. Um, and did it match what you imagined it would give back, right? <clears throat> AI facts. AI can process and analyze large amounts of data more quickly than humans. It's going to be all of those. You guys can go through them and take a quick look on those AI facts. Are all those kind of consistent with your understanding of what this technology is all about? Do you have questions about any one of those specific questions from 1 through 10? Number eight. The development and use of AI have no ethical or social implications. Well, that's false, right? It does. Um, AI can be humans a complex game like chess and go. Seems to like concentrating on gold because they always include gold in, in, in there. But those are the two major, you know, um, advances just in the world. <clears throat> Others can be biased depending on their training data. So all of those are the truth. So the, the facts ones we kind of know, right? What about the affection? I thought that this would, the fiction part would be a little more fun. Which makes it fiction. So. <laughs> I'm glad you picked up on that because that is exactly what I picked up on the first time I looked at it. As it generated it, and uh, the first time I ran that prompt, it made all the facts question true, and it made all the fiction questions false. Ah. Interesting, right? Um, so, again, a single AI can excel at any task regardless of the domain of complexity.
thoughts, right? Why is that false? Does anyone have an idea of why that is false? Right. You might repeat the answer. Huh? Probably need to repeat his answer and they didn't hear oh, it. Oh, you didn't hear the answer? Because it needs to be trained, right? right? Yeah, so because it needs to be trained, yes. Um, but I am thinking of more along the lines of the technology in general, um, the structure of it. Um, there is basically three stages of AI, and those three stages kind of define uh, what the capabilities are. So it kind of goes to what do AI models know? And let it go in here. These are the things that they know. <clears throat> Notice it, it, we have, and correct me if I'm wrong, and if, if, you know, we have this concept that we mix the issue of intelligence with consciousness. And we kind of use those terms interchangeably um, when we communicate about this technology. But those are two separate issues. Um, you can have intelligence without consciousness, right? Um, and so uh, when we look in science fiction, we see that that's what they're doing, right? They're mixing the concept of intelligence with consciousness, and that kind of drives this misconception about the technology. So, for this, so you guys don't want to talk, I'm going to have you raise your hands. <laughs> raise your left hand if you also had that same conceptual uh, viewpoint about AI. So you all, that's wonderful. So you guys are not afraid of the technology. You guys are not worried about it taking over the world. You're not worried about it coming back in time and assassinating your youngest child um, or being caught on the planet for billions of years until future aliens comes and finds us. All this stuff is, is wonderful. All right, that's great. So as you can see, um, it knows patterns and data, pre it goes by predefined rules, statistical relationships, trained responses, right? So it's important in, in understanding this stack um, of how this technology, what the technology really is and what it's capable of um, when we have these discussions. So um, this goes back to our stages of AI that I was talking about a little bit earlier. And these are the three stages of AI. One. Yeah. So you guys have heard of these three, right? Specific AI or narrow AI. Uh, um, we talk about uh, artificial general intelligence and artificial super intelligence. Um, so this so this technology, um, uh, uh, this software, and I'm going to say the software technology because artificial intelligence models are basically software uh, models, right? Um, we have currently 
we are in what is called the specific artificial um, uh, stage, right? So we have specific intelligence. Each model can do one and only one thing that it's been trained to do. Um, even though right now we are having a conversation um, in uh, the, the public domain about whether or not these machines have uh, generalized, general intelligence. The general intelligence stage is about the technology operating at the human level, meaning that it are making that it's making decisions better than humans and everything that the human can do, it can, right? The difference between uh, an AGI model and an individual is that the AGI model would have full knowledge of all knowledge domains where we as individuals are limited in our capacity with the domain uh, range that we have. Um, we all have very, uh, we all have the capacity at very level, but the uh, AGI would be able to operate. It doesn't necessarily have to operate independently, but it would be able to operate at the same level as we are. And super intelligence is when it supersedes our capacity. Um, in terms of being able to make those decisions. So, um, super intelligence is um, kind of hard to tell in the AGI to determine because how can you determine, um, or can you determine, I should say how, but that's, that's part of the problem that needs to be solved, but can you determine if you are a subspecies, right, in terms of the uh, Arctic? Uh, intelligent um, capabilities, for example, a human versus, say, a dolphin, a human, say, versus um, a horse, a cat, a dog, a tree, right? We tend to think of intelligence as only in animals, right? But plants have intelligence too, right? So it's, it's, it's encoded, it's information being encoded and being processed. <clears throat> and so, uh, would, if you are a smart tree, would you be able to tell if a human is smarter than you? Or if you were, it can often tell that humans are smarter than they are. Can we tell if we're smarter than dolphins? I don't know if you can, right? So, trying to determine that um, is, is, for me, um, is not so much as important as how we implement the technology, whether it is smarter than us or not. Because it is still software, and it's still something that we code, um, and so it will and can only act within its capacity that we give. And so uh, these other uh, prompts were aimed at that. So <clears throat> given that to speed up through this, let's see what it says here. So autonomous AGI would mean uh, that the AI model can uh, perform at human level, and then making it autonomous would then mean that it can make decisions uh, without our intervention, right? Um, some of us call that the free will. <laughs> I don't know. So, as you can see, you know, um, that's where the danger comes in with, with, with this technology or in any technology, you gotta let it loose, right? Um, but we're not gonna be there. Um, 
The, also, the reason why I did these pumps for this talk today was I wanted to, to demonstrate for you how this technology, these language models, can be used and will be used. And some of us are already using it in the capacity from uh, for educational support, right? Um, we we have in today's environment, we have people going around, you know, with different opinions, and that's that's necessary. But some folks feel, oh, we need to ban it, right? So when this technology came out, the first the first issue was. We gotta ban it, we gotta ban it, right? Because students are gonna cheat, students are gonna cheat. Um, and so um, the concept here is to embrace this technology and not be so concerned about it being used to cheat, but how you can leverage it to support that learning process, utilizing its capabilities. And that's what I want to leave you guys with is that um, finding ways to do that is where we can make huge impacts in the educational realm. Um, and our role is going to change. Our role is already changing. And we're not going to be looked at uh, BD's uh, you know, the ivory towers of knowledge, you know, that you come and we're the guardians of it. Uh, we are going to be and have been the guides through knowledge, to guide our uh, students uh, to be able to utilize this tool to do all that heavy lifting um, in terms of uh, domain knowledge. Uh, and the, the work on it, right? So we still need to focus on students having uh, the concepts, because once you understand conceptually what is going on and how these tools work, uh, what their capabilities are, then you can utilize it effectively, right? Um, so 